Thank you. It really is, I feel an honor to me to be participating in a lecture series named after Edmund S. Muskie. When I was eight years old, I was intensely politically conscious at that time, but may have had virtues nevertheless. And I remember the 1968 presidential campaign and when Democratic nominee Hubert Humphrey chose Muskie as his vice presidential candidate. That was a, 1968 was the year of by far the greatest civil unrest that we've had in this country in the 20th century. There were riots on college campuses, riots in the, in the cities, uh, people getting shot. It was a, a real sense of things that everything was spinning out of control and that we m might well be lapsing into either a police state or anarchy or some kind of disaster. And in that terribly confused presidential and conflicted presidential year, we had three major candidacies. You had Richard Nixon and Spiro Agnew running on a law and order uh, campaign, even though it turned out uh, they would later be convicted as criminals. You had George Wallace and um, Curtis LeMay running on a fairly overt platform of racism and segregation. You had the Democratic presidential nominee, Hubert Humphrey, who was widely loved as a great exemplar of, of, and progenitor of what it meant to be a liberal Democrat, but who in a lot of ways been uh, destroyed and, and ruined by his services as Lyndon Johnson's vice president and his consequent need to support the Vietnam War. And then you had Ed Muskie. And I think if the people of this country, um, many historians suggest, had had a chance out of all the vice presidential candidates and out of all the presidential candidates to choose the one who they, they wanted to make president, I think Ed Muskie would have been elected president then. He was a, became very rapidly seen as a sensible kind of person, as a person of principle, but also as a great conciliator and an incredibly turbulent, angry, um, polarized time as a voice, as as a voice of reason, but not as a voice of just reason of compromise for, for the sake of compromise, but as someone who would uh, bring principles and integrity and respect for the things that our country was founded on together in an attempt to bring the country together. And it's uh, America's loss that um, we had a uh, Nixon presidency rather than a, a, a Muskie presidency. The, the book that, that brought me here tonight is based on my research on international gun laws. And I'm, I'm not gonna just talk about guns or, or foreign countries, but it's a starting point to look at other cultures to start to answer why is America so violent? Many people will say that the reason is, fairly obviously, we have weaker gun laws than other countries do. And if we had smart gun laws like they do, we'd be that much less violent. So that's the, que that's the question I set out to examine when I started writing the book, because even though that statement I just made is a, is a widely held sentiment, there had actually been no academic research into what the gun laws of other countries are or, or how they work. So the book went out and examined in depth the gun control policies of Japan, Britain, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, Jamaica, and Switzerland, and the United States. And what I found was the foreign gun control situation is much more complex than many Americans have assumed. Among the foreign countries, there's no particular correlation between the severity of the gun control and the prevalence of gun crime. In fact, of the nations studied, the two countries that are by far the safest have diametrically opposite gun control policies. Japan, in Japan, violent crime and homicide are virtually unknown, with, with the exception of uh, crimes perpetrated by gangsters and the murder of children by suicidal parents Suicides tend to be more of a family matter in Japan because they can't conceive of the children existing other than the family, so if the adults want to commit suicide, they take the children with them. In the United States, the police would classify that as a homicide. In Japan, that's classified as a suicide. With those exceptions, it's a very safe society. Japan prohibits the, the civilian possession of handguns and rifles. Shotguns may be obtained only after a rigorous licensing process that even includes a short psychiatric examination. This almost complete prohibition on guns in Japan has been strictly enforced ever since 1588 when the military dictator Hideyoshi confiscated all firearms and all swords from the peasantry. Hideyoshi's decree perceptibly observed that, quote, the possession of unnecessarily, uh, unnecessary implements makes difficult the collection of taxes and tends to foment uprising. 
So the Japanese experience would seem to indicate, to support the theory that turning the possession of instruments of deadly force into a government monopoly will make the people safe from each other, if at least not necessarily safe from the government. There was only one other country I looked at in the book that had a murder rate as low as Japan, and that country, Switzerland, which also has a very strict gun control policy, but in a different kind of way. Every Swiss male, age 20 to 50, is strictly required to spend several weeks a year in militia training. Switzerland has no professional standing army and has always relied for defense on having its entire male population trained in warfare and ready to mobilize. As part of the militia duty, every militiaman, in other words, every male age 20 to 50, is given a fully automatic assault rifle, required to keep it in his home, and obliged to periodically demonstrate his marksmanship proficiency. Swiss policy makes the acquisition of other weapons simple, too, and as well as for women and for men who are too old to serve in the militia. Ammunition sales are subsidized. There are 3,000 shooting ranges in a nation two-thirds the size of the state of West Virginia. Many long guns can be bought with no restrictions at all, in contrast to the United States, where at the very least, every long gun sale is registered at the point of sale by the dealer, by federal law. Most handguns and some rifles require a simple permit to purchase, which is given freely to any adult who is not a criminal, alcoholic, or otherwise disqualified. Even anti-tank weapons, howitzers, anti-aircraft guns, and cannons may be purchased with a readily obtained license. As a result of all this, in the United States, machine guns may be legally owned after passing through a very tough federal licensing process. And in the United States, there is about one legally owned machine gun for every 650 Americans. In Switzerland, there is one legally owned machine gun for every 10 Swiss. Firearms, shooting competitions, and survival training pervade Swiss life in a way that would startle most suburban Americans who see guns mainly on television. And yet, for all the machine guns and other weapons in Switzerland, that country is as safe as Japan and significantly safer than countries uh, with much more restrictive gun control laws, such as Great Britain or Australia. What Japan and Switzerland have in common, and what's conspicuously absent in much of the metropolitan United States, is a very strong family structure, tightly knit communities, stable residential patterns, and good relationships across generational lines. The crucial variable here seems not to be the presence of firearms, but the degree to which young people are successfully socialized into non-criminal, responsible behavior patterns. The evidence from the other nations was consistent with the Swiss-Japanese experience. At the turn of the century, Great Britain had no gun control laws at all. Convicted violent felons, the criminally insane, and anyone else could buy and carry anything from a Derringer to a sawed-off shotgun to a Gatling gun with no registration and no licensing. The only requirement was ready cash. And yet, Great Britain had almost no gun crime, as the constraints imposed by the Victorian Code of Behavior provided the most effective gun control that country has ever experienced. As the 20th century has progressed, laws in Great Britain have grown, gun laws in Great Britain have grown increasingly severe, so that now only about 4% of households legally own guns. And those households are subject to arbitrary inspections by a police force with the announced goal of eliminating civilian gun ownership. And although Britain is generally safer than the United States, violent crime and gun crime have skyrocketed compared to earlier decades. The total violent crime rate in Great Britain in 1992 was equal to the 1985 United States level. That, that's better than we are, but it's, it's uncomfortably close. While Britain, in the name of public safety, has abolished or drastically constricted many rights that Americans take for granted, including the right to bear arms, the right to a criminal jury trial, the right to a grand jury indictment, the right of a criminal defendant to confront his accuser, and by the most recent government law, the right to silence, the concentration of ever greater power in the hands of the government has been a poor antidote for the steady decline in the socialization of children into responsible behavior by the community. In all the countries I studied, there was only one case where a gun law led to a statistically perceptible drop in gun crime. Now, I will contrast what I just said about gun crime with the effect of the foreign gun laws on the gun suicide rate. The evidence from these other countries suggests very clearly that gun controls did lead to a drop in gun suicides, although the evidence is much more ambiguous as to whether they reduced the overall suicide rate or whether there was simply a substitution effect. The one gun control that really reduced gun law that reduced gun crime was enacted in Jamaica 
where a 1974 gun confiscation law was accompanied by numerous other repressive measures, including house-to-house -house searches, incommunicado detention, secret trials, mandatory life in prison for possession of a single bullet, warrantless searches and seizures, and military enforcement of the drug laws. Everything I've just named, by the way, is, by the way, has been proposed in the United States by various folks. The Jamaican violent crime rate dropped significantly for six months, returned to its former level over the next year, and then began to grow substantially worse than it had ever been. As the homicide rate in Jamaica soared far above American levels, about a third of all Jamaican homicides were being perpetrated by the police. A Jamaican suffered a higher risk of being murdered by the police than an American did of being murdered by anyone. According to the human rights group America's Watch, policemen would murder personal en enemies and then falsely claim that the victims were killed in a shootout. Homicides perpetrated by the police were rarely investigated, as long as the policeman claimed that the victim had a gun. The increase in police violence, made possible in part by middle-class hysteria over guns, in turn fueled a cycle of violence in the rest of Jamaican society. Almost every scholar who has studied the Jamaican crime situation shares the conclusion of criminologist William Calathe's award-winning analysis, which found that the gun restrictions, as well as the other restrictions on civil liberties, were the result of highly developed skills of political management, which were designed not to reduce crime, but to distract public attention away from the underlying problems of Jamaican society, including economic inequality. Which brings us to the question, then, of if guns are not the only reason why America is so much more violent than other nations, what are some of the explanations? Here, here are some of the uh, tentative answers that uh, my historical research suggested. First of all, and this is one that is not discussed nearly enough in the gun control debate in the United States or in, in general, is the effect of the government. As the great Supreme Court Justice Louis Brandeis observed, government is the great teacher. And the democratic nations which have adopted strict gun control systems, which are complied with by a large fraction of the people, have succeeded in part through the example set by the government. While in these countries the police have not been entirely disarmed of handguns, they are in practice far less oriented towards gun use than the American police. For example, in Japan, which completely pro prohibits civilian handguns, the police do possess handguns, but in a manner very different from American police. The Japanese police only began carrying guns at the repeated insistence of General MacArthur's government of occupation. The police have merely 38 special revolvers, six shooters, and not the high power or high capacity 45, 45 caliber and 9 millimeter handguns often toted by the American police. No Japanese officer would ever carry a second smaller handgun as a backup, as many American police do. Japanese police may not add individual touches, such as pearl handles or unusual holsters, to dress up their gun. While American police are often required to carry guns while off duty, and almost always granted the privilege if they wish, even if they're retired, Japanese police must always leave their guns at the station. Unlike in the United States, desk-bound desk police administrators, traffic police, most plainclothes detectives, and even the riot police in Japan do not carry guns. The official Japanese police culture strongly discourages use or glamorization of guns. One poster on the wall orders, don't take it out of the holster, don't put your finger on the trigger, don't point it at people. Shooting at a fleeing felon is unlawful under any circumstance. In the average year, the entire poli Tokyo police force fires only a half dozen or so shots. The police being disarmed, criminals reciprocate. Although guns are available on the Japanese black market, there is little use of guns in crime. The riot police leave their guns at the station, and when masses of angry rioting students confront the riot police in a semi-traditional uh, spring ritual, the students issue weapons too. The two sides instead study medieval military tactics, using mass formations of humans as battering rams or shields. Comparative criminologist David Bailey, a proponent of stricter American gun controls, suggests that the American police attitude towards guns makes it impossible for gun control to be achieved. As long as the police are armed, writes Bailey, they send the implicit message that armed confrontations with civilians are the norm, and that shootings of police officers, while sad, are nothing extraordinary. In Britain as well, the, police are most, the fact that the police are mostly disarmed is one of the important reasons why criminals and non-criminal civilians mostly avoid handguns. Even in London, only about 15% of the police carry guns. The sole police who are, who are permanently armed are special security forces for diplomatic royalty, royalty and ministerial protection. The patrolmen who are given guns 
um, usually do not carry backup guns. They don't carry, even carry the same gun from day to day. At the end of every shift, the gun goes back into the police safe. High-ranking police administrators almost never carry guns. Contrast that situation with where in Great Britain, if a chief of police goes on television and says, we need more gun control laws, the guy is, after all, not carrying a gun, and somebody says, people really, I don't want a society where people are wearing weapons for protection. He's got some credibility there. Contrast that with the same kind of situation in the United States where a, a big city police chief may go on TV and say, it's a terrible thing that people should be carrying guns for protection. You really shouldn't have a weapon. And he's got a cold 45 on his hip. It, it, it's you know, it's kind of like sending someone who's drunk to give a temperance message. In 1987, only five Brightons were shot dead by the police, and even this number was seen as alarmingly high. Police authority in Britain has historically re rested not on the ability to compel submission, but upon the benign, non-aggressive image of the unarmed British Bobby. The police authority has been achieved by presenting an image of vulnerability instead of invincibility as the Continental or American police attempt to sometimes present. An almost totally disarmed police was always the British ideal, but starting with the 1967 Shepherd's Bush murders, in which criminals with stolen revolvers shot three police officers, a growing minority of police officers have begun to patrol armed. As the police have become more heavily armed, so have criminals. Armed robberies and police armament closely correlate, criminological studies suggest, in a, cause, in a mutual cause and effect relationship. In Britain, the police are mostly unarmed. In Japan, the police hardly ever draw their guns, and few people in either nation own guns. The Canadian police, in contrast, are well-armed and more likely to use their guns than, than their British or Japanese counterparts. The Canadian police use of guns legitimizes gun use in general, and that is one reason why Canadians choose to own so many more guns compared to Japanese or British. In fact, Canada, um, although Canada has a lower density of handguns per capita than the United States, the number of rifles per capita in Canada is equal to, to American levels. But even though the Canadian police are well armed, they don't use their firearms nearly as frequently as their American counterparts. In America, about a person a day is killed by the police, usually lawfully. In Canada, in Canada the per capita police homicide rate is less than a third of the American rate. And we see this not just in their in statistical studies, but in the, in, uh, the Waco situation in which uh, in 1992, 1993, the federal government in the United States, the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms, lied to a federal magistrate in order to procure a search warrant to search, to search and arrest one man who lived in a house with 126 other people. Rather than attempting to serve the search warrant by knocking at the door and saying, can we come in and search, here's the warrant, serve the search warrant by trying to shoot their way in, strafing the building with, from above with helicopter gunfire, hitting a room that they knew contained women and children, and using concussion grenades. When that, when that approach didn't work, a siege ensued, and after a while, the federal government grew impatient and ended the siege through the use of tanks and a chemical warfare agent which has been banned from international warfare by civilized nations and the treaty to which the United States is a signatory, a chemical warfare agent which is known to be potentially lethal when used against children and which is known to be highly flammable in enclosed places. Contrast that American approach with what happened um, about a year or two before Waco when there was a Mohawk uprising in, in the province of Quebec. Uh, the Mohawk Nation protesting the federal uh, plans to expand a golf course onto an Indian, into Indian sacred territory um, took over an area and uh, set themselves up in a siege. Although, and what happened was the siege went on for months and months and months. The Mohawks were extremely heavily armed, all the way up to machine guns and, and heavy explosives. And in contrast to the folks at Waco who were out on the edge of nowhere in a farm that nobody would have paid attention to if the federal government hadn't shown up, this Mohawk siege in Quebec caused a tremendous national traffic jam by tying up the road network around Montreal and caused literally the loss of millions of hours of commuting time and daily inconvenience to people throughout Canada. And yet, through that incredibly, through the provocation of people starting the situation and then causing a traffic jam, which we know often provokes homicide. In Canada, in contrast to the American situation where you had some people who wanted to be left alone and were suddenly attacked, in Canada, the siege up there was ended peacefully through negotiation despite the much heavier, le heavier level of provocation. And in the United States, the Waco tragedy 
has led to a, was one of the things that has spurred a massive amount of armament by the American people in the last two years, as many people have become concerned uh, that they can no longer trust the federal government, and that in fact the federal government may one day try to kill them. What else is there besides the American government's higher levels of violence, which explains why we have more personal violence in the United States and also higher levels of gun ownership? One very clear answer is the word individualism. In fact, this word was created by uh, Alexis de Tocqueville when he was traveling the United States uh, to write his um, great volume, Democracy in America. And he made up the word individualism because it was a description of something he had seen in America, which was, at least in degree, unique in the world. More than any other society in recorded history, the United States is premised on individualism. Mistrust of government and faith in individual initiative are so deeply ingrained in the American character that many Americans may not understand how aberrational they are until they look at other countries. Just as, just as one small example, America's major liberal party, the Democratic Party, supports less government intervention in the economy than does the, do the right-wing parties in, great, in Canada and Great Britain. America's pervasive individualism means that Americans, compared to the peoples of other democratic nations, are less bound to the standards of family, church, employer, community, or state. For the most part, American individualism and freedom produces tremendous benefits, such as America's great artistic creativity and its high rate of mechanical invention. But the weakening of social control leaves some people without the restraints that might, in other societies, prevent them from becoming criminals. While American criminals are increasingly ruthless and callous towards human life, including their own, even the criminals of many other nations retain ties to the social order which would be incomprehensible to Americans. For example, in Japan, there's the normal amount of organized crime and police corruption. And when Japanese gangsters hear from one of their informants in the police department that the police are about to pull off a raid on gangster headquarters, the gangsters will vacate the premises, but they will leave a few handguns behind for the police to confiscate so the police conducting the raid will not lose face. Few American criminals display much concern for the emotional well-being of the police. American individualism fits into a capitalist economy where survival of the fittest and blaming of victims for their own plight are emphasized much more than in other nations. Income inequality is greater in America than in other nations. The social welfare safety net is considerably worse and in some respects criminogenic. And the American ideology labels every poor person a failure. All of the above reinforce each other to produce high levels of resentment-based crime. The effect is enhanced by the American ideology of social equality, in which persons are taught that there are no legitimate classes and that one person is just as good as another, which leads in the minds of some folks to the conclusion that they have just as much entitlement to a rich person's property as does the rich person. Combined with the unintended effect, side effects of a strongly individualist, capitalist economic system are the effects of racism. America is more racially diverse than any other developed democracy, and America's racial problem far exceeds those of other nations. Only in America was a major part of the population brought into the nation via kidnapping, enslaved for more than two centuries, viciously oppressed and segregated for another century, and then liberated into a destructive welfare system. In addition, from the first moments of white settlement, America's history has legitimated and encouraged violence. While the whites moving into Australia quickly dispatched resistance from the Stone Age Aborigines, and while the Canadian government successfully negotiated Indian treaties to peacefully settle the Canadian frontier, the United States of America was wrested from Indian hands by a savage war of genocide that lasted three centuries. The cruel war between Indians and whites helped inculcate in white Americans the heroic willingness to die to protect what one has and the less than heroic willingness to kill to get what one wants. While America had 69 Indian wars, Canada had none. Unlike Great Britain or Canada or Sweden or Australia, but like Israel and Switzerland, which are two very heavily armed nations, the United States won its independence through a long and difficult war of national liberation, in which ordinary citizens bringing their own weapons to battle with an imperial standing army played a decisive role. Later, the American Civil War led to government-sanctioned killing on a vast scale 
as well as a sanctification of that killing for the noble ends of abolition or for the South's supposedly glorious lost cause. While the Canadian West was peacefully settled under the supervision of a mounted police force that was on hand to provide law and order before the settlers began to arrive, the American frontier, whether that frontier was Western Pennsylvania in the early 18th century or Nevada in the late 19th century, was a Hobbesian chaotic world where the government was ineffectual and individuals had to protect themselves with force or die. In the urban eastern United States, meanwhile, rapid industrialization and massive immigration proceeded simultaneously, as they did not in most other democratic nations. And immigrants, rather than coming from a relatively small region, such as the British Isles, which was the source of almost all the immigration into Australia and New Zealand, the American immigrants came from astonishingly disparate backgrounds and frequently encountered problems adapting to their new nation. Partly as a result, the violent crime rate in 19th century cities such as Philadelphia was far higher than even in America's Wild West. Again and again, Americans have displayed an unusual willingness to use violence to achieve their ends. Unlike the more accommodating British capitalists, American captains of industry in the 19th century were quick to use violence to suppress labor militants. Well, having said all that about our, our violent history and upbringing, are we really, we do have to acknowledge that in some ways, America has an extremely high rate of violence right now. But it's also important to recognize that in other, some other very important ways, America is less violent than other countries. For example, while the United States has much more violent crime than many other nation, nations, and this is true both for crimes which generally involve guns, such as homicides, and for crimes which almost never involve guns, such as rape. They're both disproportionately much higher in the United States. The United States anomalously has less burglary. In terms of burglaries perpetrated against occupied residences, the American advantage is even greater. In Canada, for example, a Toronto study found that 48% of burglaries were against occupied homes, and 21% of burglaries involved a confrontation with the victim. In contrast, only 13% of American residential burglaries are attempted against occupied homes. Similarly, most Canadian residential burglaries occur in the nighttime, while American burglars are known to prefer daytime entry to reduce the risk of armed confrontation. Similarly, in Britain, a 1982 survey found that 59% of attempted burglaries involved an occupied home, and that's again against nearly 13% in the United States. Now, why should American criminals, who've proven that they engage in murder, rape, and robbery at a much higher rate than their counterparts in other nations, display such a curious reluctance to perpetrate burglaries, particularly against occupied residences? Could the answer be they're afraid of getting shot? When an American burglar strikes at an occupied residence, his chance of being shot is equal to his chance of going to jail. As a little unintentional experiment in the deterrent effect of, burg of firearms and home burglaries in the United States in the mid-1960s, some well-intentioned anti-violence folks in New York City passed out window decals in which the homeowner could proclaim, uh, this home contains no guns. Um, that experiment ended very rapidly. Now, roughly speaking, about 50% of all American homes contain a gun. And obviously the burglar doesn't know which 50% it is, but it's also a very, uh, an extremely high density of guns so that the risk of entry into any particular home carries a fairly substantial risk of running, in, if you run into a home when somebody's there, of running into somebody with a gun. In contrast, 4% or less of the American population carries a gun on the streets. Now, some of the gun policies of other nations are not necessarily like this. In Israel, for example, a permit to own a gun is the same as a permit to carry a gun, and it's considered preferable that gun owners do carry the gun, because then it won't be home alone where it can get stolen. And if something dangerous happens, the person can protect themselves. One of the things I looked at in the historical analysis of the United States is the question, what if everybody carried a gun? Well, actually, there was a time in American history when everybody did carry a gun. This, of course, was the Wild West, which is we know mostly today through John Wayne movies and, and similar kinds of not necessarily historically accurate phenomena. A historian named Roger McGrath, in a book called Gunfighters, Highwaymen, and Vigilantes, 
studied two uh, mining camps, mining towns, in the Sierra Nevada mountains in the 19th century and looked in detail at their criminal records to find out exactly what was the scope of criminal violence in those places where everybody was, was packing heat. Now, Aurora and Bodie certainly had as much potential for violence as any place in the West. The population was mainly young transient males subjected to few social controls. Indeed, the reason they were out there in the first place was they were, for one reason or another, failures in their previous lives further east and were, were going, going out there to get away from their problems. There was one saloon for every 25 men, and brothels and gambling houses were also common. Governmental law enforcement was ineffectual, and sometimes the sheriff was himself the head of a criminal gang. Nearly everyone carried a gun. The homicide rate in those towns was extremely high, as the bad men who hung out in saloons shot each other at a fearsome rate, in some cases exceeding the rate in modern Washington, D.C. The presence of guns turned many petty drunken quarrels into fatalities. But other crime was virtually nil. The per capita annual robbery rate was 7% of modern New York cities. The burglary rate, 1%. Rape was unknown. The old, the weak, the female, the innocent, and those unwilling to fight were rarely the target of attacks, McGrath found. One resident of Bodie did not recall ever hearing of a respectable woman or girl in any manner insulted or even accosted by the hundreds of dissolute characters that were everywhere. In part, this was due to the respect depravity pays to decency in part to the knowledge that sudden death would follow any other course. Everyone carried a gun, and except for young men who liked to drink and fight with each other, everyone was far more secure than today's residents of cities with gun prohibitions. The experience of Aurora and Bodie was repeated throughout the West. One study of five major cattle towns with a reputation for violence, Abilene, Ellsworth, Wichita, Dodge City, and Caldwell, found that altogether the towns had less than two criminal homicides per year. During the 1870s, Lincoln County, New Mexico, was in a state of anarchy and civil war. Homicide was astronomical, but, as in Aurora and Bodie, confined almost exclusively to drunken males upholding their honor. Modern big city crimes such as rape, burglary, and mugging were virtually unknown. A study of the Texas frontier from 1875 to 1890 found that burglaries and robberies, except for bank, train, and stagecoach robberies, were essentially non-existent. People did not bother locking doors, and murder was rare, except, of course, for young men shooting each other in fair fights that they voluntarily engaged in. Historian John Umbeck's investigation of the High Sierra gold fields in the mid-19th century yielded similar results. After the gold rush brought on by the discovery of gold at Sutter's Mill in 1848, thousands of prospectors rushed to gold fields in the California mountains. There was no police force. Indeed, there was no law at all regarding property rights, since the military governor of California had just proclaimed as invalid, without bothering to offer a replacement, the Mexican land law. There was intense competitive pressure and greed for gold, and nearly everyone carried firearms. Yet there was hardly any violence. Similarly, when much of the Indian Territory of Oklahoma was opened all at once for white settlement in the 1890s, heavily armed settlers rushed in immediately to stake their claims, and the settlers with their guns arrived long before effective law enforcement did. Yet there was nearly no violence. In sum, historian Eugene Holland found the Western frontier was a far more civilized, more peaceful, and safer place than American society is today. Historian Frank Purcell concludes this last frontier left no significant heritage of, heritage of offenses against the person relative to other sections of the country. Americans living under gun prevalence conditions of the Old West were far safer than Americans living in modern cities such as Washington, D.C. with handgun prohibition. And significantly, the protective value of those handguns, extend, handguns carried by a large fraction of the population extends to all, per, all elements of the population, just as the fact that your neighbor has a, a gun deters the burglary of your home and your neighbor's home, the fact that the person on the bus next to you is carrying a gun may deter criminals from attacking anyone. There is one other important concept in which we should perhaps think about whether the United States really is so violent, and that is the concept not just of individual crime, of burglaries and rapes and robberies perpetrated by lone criminals, but the total rate of crime perpetrated by anyone. In particular, I'm referring to the total rate of homicide. And once we recognize that the government can murder people too, then the comparative homicide picture shifts rather dramatically. <clears throat> 
According to, to Bartlett Rummel, the uh, leading academic scholar of, uh, of genocide on a worldwide basis, in this century, approximately 175 million people have been murdered by the government. That doesn't include combatants in wars. That includes civilians intentionally murdered or starved to death by the government. This means that government is by far the greatest threat to human life through violent means in this world. Not the, all the criminals in the world don't come close in the aggregate to doing what government has accomplished in terms of killing innocent people. Professor Rummel suggests that the, what paves the way for genocide is unchecked governmental power. As Mao Zedong, himself a perpetrator of one of the largest genocides in human history, observed, political power grows out of the barrel of a gun. Not as, of all the homicides studied by Bartlett, by Bartlett Rummel, ranging from the ones in China, the Soviet Union, and Nazi Germany, to some of the more obscure ones, such as those in North Korea, Poland, and Guatemala, in not a single one of those were the genocides perpetrated against armed victims. To the contrary, in every one of those, the government actively sought to disarm the potential genocide victims before attempting to perpetrate genocide. That has staggering implications, really, because it means that for one thing, whatever else the effect of guns in the United States is, as long as current gun prevalence conditions continue, it is very unlikely the genocide could ever occur in the United States. Now, of course, as, as Americans, we may say, well, what's the chance it could happen here anyway? It, that, the calculation of guns to prevent against genocide may, for example, be something that people in North Korea or Germany or the Soviet, former Soviet Union might want to take into account. But after all, you know, this is America. It's not going to happen here. In fact, it can't happen here. But actually, it did happen here. The United States was conquered, taken away from the people who were living in it, the Indian population, through a long, deliberate, and continuous policy of genocide. This policy was well known throughout the world. And in fact, Adolf Hitler uh, wrote about it admiringly and used it as a model for his own plans. More recently, during World War II, American citizens, American citizens who happen to be of Japanese ancestry, were by martial law placed into concentration camps for the duration of the war. In 1944, a point by which the, the Allies were clearly going to win the war, and it was only a matter of time, the Gallup organization took a poll and asked people, what should we do with Japan after we win the war? There were various answers. Keep them totally impoverished. Try to rehabilitate them. 12% of the American population said, exterminate the Japanese people. This isn't a war. We're fighting against a country that's exterminating other people. And 12% of the American population said the first thing we should do after we win is exterminate um, our enemies, at least the ones of a different race from us. Now, I don't think there's any possibility, despite all the talk you may hear on talk radio stations about black helicopters in the United Nations and things like that, that genocide is going to occur in the United States in the possibly foreseeable future. But one thing that history tells us is that you can't see 50 or 100 years into the future. Put yourself, for example, in the world back in 1900, as it then existed, and you were told that 35 years from now, one particular nation is going to start a policy of racial oppression and genocide and try to kill as many Jews as it possibly can. And then you're told, lay down your bets, which country do you think it's going to be? If you were an intelligent gambler, you would never bet on Germany. Germany was an advanced industrial democracy with a better social welfare system than any place in the world, and in fact was the most tolerant place in the world socially for Jews to live. Jews enjoyed better acceptance into society in Germany in 1900 than they did in England or France or the United States. And yet 35 years later, things changed fairly significantly in Germany. I don't think 12% of the German population in 1900 would have answered a poll, what should we do with the Jews, and they would have said, kill them all. And yet, not long after, that's exactly what the government was doing. One of the ways in which gun control, besides being a direct pre preventative to genocide, at least from the views of genocidal governments, is not only how it distributes physical force as practical terms, in terms of pe pe people being able to shoot soldiers who are coming to kill them, and most soldiers tend not to want to get shot 
but it's also the moral message that it sends in terms of how it builds the character of the people. And widespread gun ownership sends the message that government is subordinate to and not the master of the people. But despite all that, we're Steer Hill in the United States right now. There aren't any concentration camps, and we have an intolerably high violence rate. So what should we do about that? Well, as we try to think about what we can do about our current American violence rate, it's important to understand how it's set up. Violence is not something that is uniformly distributed throughout American society. A study by the Centers for Disease Control of homicide rates among teenagers brings this home very dramatically. The study sets out the different homicide rates in the United States by gender, by urban concentration from core urban to uh, extended urban to suburban to small town to rural, and by age groups and by race. For all the various groups in rural areas, which by the way is where gun access is most pervasive and easiest, in the rural areas the homicide rate is essentially zero. Nationally in the United States, for all of our all age groups aggregated together, for about the last 25 to 30 years, the national homi the homicide rate has been about 9 to 10 homicides per 100,000 population per year. It's actually been very stable compared to some other crime rates, which have fluctuated up and down. So we have a general American homicide rate of 9 or 10 per 100,000 population per year. For rural teenagers, all races, all, all genders, all ages, it's about zero. But for black, inner city, male teenagers aged 15 to 19, the homicide rate is 160. It is just off the charts. There's, there is nothing remotely close to it, and it is an indication of a tremendous social disaster in progress. Would it be a good idea if these teenagers who are killing each other, and other people as well, were disarmed? It obviously would be. These homicides are not lawful homicides that are later classified by the police as protective. These are almost entirely criminal homicides, and it's a good idea to take guns away from people who are perpetrating criminal homicides. But the question is, can we do that? The United States, starting in 1911, embarked on a national drug prohibition policy for cocaine and opiates with the Harrison Narcotics Act of 1911. Now that act, we've had it in effect for nearly a century. It is rigorously enforced, state, na nationally. There's no waiting periods to buy cocaine or rules that you can buy crack, but you can't buy, you can buy powder cocaine, but you can't buy crack because it's an assault drug or something like that. We have a total comprehensive national prohibition. It is enforced with harder and harder laws every year, extremely severe mandatory sentences. For example, there's a federal mandatory sentence that if you're caught with simply six, in possession of six grams of crack, that is a mandatory five-year federal felony in prison. And yet, with all the tremendous law enforcement resources that have been devoted to taking drugs away from the American population, at least in the inner cities, for the population groups that are perpetrating these homicides, drugs are the easiest thing in the world to find. And if we can't disarm a population through a complete prohibition on a substance, on a substance that you have to manufacture on another continent and import into the United States, di chemically bonded inside Samsonite suitcases and then melt the suitcase to get the cocaine out, if we can't take cocaine away from that population, and in fact, cocaine's the easiest thing in the world to get, then it is simply ridiculous to imagine that some kind of gun control policies involving licensing, registration, or anything up to complete prohibition and confiscation is going to make guns impossible to find for criminals who want to find them. Well, what is there we can do? One of the sad things about the national crime debate, as you watch things like the, the crime bill that went through Congress last year, and then the Republican alternative crime bill that's going through Congress this year, is the degree to which, on both sides of the political spectrum, the various sides focus on issues of essentially, at best, marginal relevance. We now have 50 new federal death penalties, thanks to the Democratic Crime Bill, um, which sounds awfully tough, although some of them for offenses like uh, killing a federal uh, agriculture inspector in the course of performance of his duties don't seem to really address major crime problems that we're having in this country. And in any case, there is no research yet 
which has ever shown a uh, deterrent effect of the death penalty. Certainly no effect that is, no research that has shown a deterrent effect of the death penalty on the scale in which it is applied in America. In, in England, uh, in the 18th century, they, they, in 17th centuries, they hung criminals right and left for not only for homicides, but for things going down to robbery and burglary, and in some cases, petty theft. Perhaps at that level, there may be a deterrent effect of the death penalty, but certainly not at the level that a, a civilized society in the 20th century would want to implement it. And then you have debates over banning assault weapons, which turn out actually not to be guns which are machine guns, but which simply have cosmetic similarities to them, and which statistics show are only used in about 1% of gun crime. We have debates over things like midnight basketball, which may or may not be a prevention, but is certainly not going to be something that is going to dramatically pull the crime rate down. With all this debate on various sides over tangential and often symbolic issues, what are some things we could do that would really make not just at best a 1 or 2% difference in the crime rate, but which could lead to dramatic drops in the crime rate and make America a significantly safer society? Well, let me suggest two solutions, one of them a short-term solution and one of them which would take a longer term to take effect. First of all, I think we should end the drug war. At the very least, it should be ended at the federal level. On the federal level, it's an easy argument to make because the federal government has no constitutional authority over crime in general. Uh, the federal government is delegated, unlike state governments, enumerated powers over specific issues, issues such as the military, the post office, interstate commerce, and the like, and has no authority to enact general criminal law in the first place. Even putting that aside, the effect of the drug war on our national crime rate has been disastrous. One of the ways in which it has been a disaster has been the displacement effect that the drug law has had on the rest of law enforcement. A huge number of cases in, in the federal courts, it's, very, it's impossible practically to get a civil trial in progress in a, in a business lawsuit because the federal court's docket is so heavily jammed with drug cases. This is true on the state and local levels as well as prosecutors, judges, probation officers, and everyone else are overwhelmed by a huge influx of drug cases that makes it much more difficult to concentrate resources on the violent crime cases. This also occurs particularly, not, not particularly, it occurs everywhere, but it also occurs very visibly in the, in the prison system. And that if you aggregate the state and federal prison systems together, the number of people going into prison now for drug crimes exceeds the number going in for violent crimes. That's a dramatic change from our sentencing policies in, in the 1980s when the number of people going into prison for, drug, for violent crimes exceeded by a factor of about six to one, the number going in for drug crimes. We're now putting more people in for drugs than we are for violence. In the federal prison system, approximately 70% of federal prisoners are in there for some kind of drug offense. One out of every six federal prisoners is, according to a Department of Justice study, a nonviolent, first-time, minor drug offender. Professor uh, Morgan Reynolds, who's an economist at Texas A&M, has done a calculation of what he calls the expected punishment of crime. You take the risk of being caught times the chance that if you are caught, you'll be prosecuted, the chance that if prosecuted, you'll be convicted. If you're prosecuted, if you're convicted, what's the chance you'll go to prison? If you're in prison, how long will you actually serve as opposed to the time that you're nominally sentenced to? And based on that, he comes up with the expected punishment for crime. Since the drug war has, been has entered its most recent phase, beginning in 1987, the expected punishment for violent crime has plummeted. The viol expected punishment for homicide in the United States is 1.8 years. The expected punishment for burglary is five years. 1987 is an important turning point year for us to look at in the disaster that the drug war has been. Because that's a year when the black teenage homicide rate began soaring upward after many years of decline. Now this year was not marked by any sudden increase in the availability of guns. In fact, uh, sales were quite flat at the time and, and had been flat until Bill Clinton stirred up the whole issue and, and led to the greatest years on, in history for the American gun is, industry over the last two years. What did happen in 1987 was that the drug war suddenly intensified, and at the same time, drugs became more dangerous. The 1987 cocaine overdose death of college basketball star Len Bias and the popularization of crack cocaine produced an unprecedented media and political determination 
to fight a drug war in the United States. Now, some drug policy scholars trace the sudden upsurge in violence to the pharmacological effects of crack cocaine. And they note that crack, like PCP and like alcohol, but unlike hemp and heroin, often reduces inhibitions against violence and stimulates aggressive behavior. Without denying the destructive effect of crack, other scholars trace the roots of the violence to governmental drug policy. They note that the war on drugs has lived up to its name by producing a genuine war in inner city America. Economist Sam Staley argues that the war on drugs and the criminalization of the drug trade generate levels of violence that make the inner city unlivable, with levels of violence far higher than would occur in a world where drugs were controlled by means other than the criminal law. Since drug dealers are likely to be carrying large sums of money, they are at serious risk of robbery. Since they cannot rely on the police for protection, they must, to survive, protect themselves. When drug dealers engage in commercial transactions with each other, there's no uniform commercial code and no state district court for resolving disputes about the quality of goods sold. Disgruntled buyers, having no other means of redress, may resort to violence. Similarly, the addicts who sell drugs often end up consuming the drugs which should have been sold. Higher level dealers, having no legal means of redress, tend to handle salespersons who stole the merchandise through violence. Other drug users buy goods on credit and fail to pay their debt, and since the seller again has no lawful means of debt collection, violence again results. In addition, when disputes are settled violently, they are often settled in the most vicious manner possible, since acquiring a reputation for being willing to, quote, exert maximum force may assert in the re resolution of future disputes. The tendency of our current drug laws to promote violence can be seen in a study of cocaine-related homicides in New York. 87% of the homicides were related to territorial disputes, debt collection, or cocaine deals gone bad. Only 7.5% of the homicides were related to the pharmacological effect of the drug. There are many reasons why teenagers join gangs, but the lure of income from dr the drug trade is certainly an important factor. If currently illegal drugs were sold in liquor stores, gangs would no longer be able to profit from selling substances at the artificially high prices created by prohibition laws. I would suggest that if we re-legalize drugs overnight, and it's important to say re-legalized because drugs in this country were legal until the 1911 Harrison Narcotics Act, and with the exception of, of, hair, of opiates and cocaine, remain legal until the Marijuana Stamp Act in the 1930s. I'd suggest also that putting aside the violence effects, that it is simply inconsistent, implausible, and any immoral for a society in which we recognize that people have such a powerful right to personal autonomy, to control of their own body, that a woman has the right to have an abortion, which means to kill a fetus, and I'm strongly in favor of legal abortion, but an abortion is the intentional killing of an innocent being. You can argue about angels and pinheads and whether it's a human. It's clearly the killing of an innocent something because the woman's right to bodily integrity is so strong that it can be protected through snuffing out another life if necessary. Now, in a society where the protection of your physical body, your right to physical autonomy, is that strong, it is simply illogical and, and indeed morally hypocritical to claim that an individual can't choose to ingest psychoactive substances. After, after alcohol prohibition was ended in 1933 by the repeal of the Volstead Amendment, the homicide rate in the country within a few years dropped by 50%. If we could achieve even a fraction of that 50% drop by re-legalizing drugs, I think we would make tremendous progress against violence. That, vi that progress would come at the cost of increased drug abuse. When, vi when alcohol was illegal, rates of alcohol-related diseases dropped dramatically, things like uh, liver diseases and so forth. And in fact, it took them 50 years uh, before they finally ratcheted up to the levels they were at before prohibition. Prohibition in the net through prevention of alcohol-related diseases saved lives, but it saved the lives of people who might have otherwise become alcoholics. And what the country decided when it repealed prohibition was that protecting people from the consequences of their own internally destructive behavior was less important than protecting innocent people from the violence that prohibition generates. There's a second solution I'd like to suggest, 
And that's a much more long-term one. And if we enacted this, drug prohibition enacted today would start saving lives tomorrow, lots of lives. A second solution, though, is a much longer-term one, which will start to save lives approximately 15 years from now, and more and more lives as we go on from there. But it is the essence of what we are going to have to do if we are going to have a society in which the violence rates decline rather than going to much higher levels from where we are now. Of all the things in a person's background that are associated with violent crime, by far, by far, the great predictor is coming from a broken or never formed home. If you look at a spectrum of intact families, of broken families, and of never formed families, of illegitimate births in which the child grows up never knowing a father, you can see in a line the, the in much higher rates of crime that come from these different kinds of homes. Now, in the intact homes, I'm not trying to be say everybody has to be like Ozzie and Harriet. An intact home can include a home with, with adoptive parents. It can include a home, for that matter, with two parents of the same gender. But I'm talking about two-parent homes, homes that are broken, that were once two-parent homes, but now have less than, one parent, less than two parents, and then homes that have never been formed in the first place. 70% of juveniles in state reform institutions come from homes with no father. A recent study by, Baruch Co by Dr. June O'Neill of Baruch College, it's, it's, I'll take, take her back, she comes in a second. 60% of rapists, 75% of teenage homicide perpetrators, and most gang members come from single parent homes. A recent study, here, here we are, by Dr. June O'Neill of Baruch College in New York City conducted for the Department of Health and Human Services, found that if you compare young black males who grow up in a single parent home versus young black males who grow up in a two parent home, in the single parent home, they're twice as likely to become involved in crime. If, on the other hand, they grow up in a not only a single parent home, but in a neighborhood where there are lots of single parent homes, then they are three times as likely to become involved in crime. And that's in a very carefully controlled study that holds constant all other socioeconomic variables, uh, such as poverty. It's true that single parent homes generally have lower income levels than two parent homes. This holds all those kinds of things constant. The correlation between illegitimacy and crime is so powerful that once you control for illegitimacy, race and poverty disappear as predictive factors for crime. If you had a Martian come down and say, we're, you know, I'm, I'm a Martian criminologist, what, what parts of the population are involved in crime? Probably the average guy on the street would say, poor black people. And the, the person would be right in that poor black people are, they're not the majority of criminals, but they are proportionally much more highly involved in crime than other population groups. But once you adjust for illegitimacy, that all disappears. Illegitimacy is the predictive factor, and race and poverty only show up as correlates of crime to the extent that they themselves are indicators of illegitimacy. Now, this, the correlation between illegitimacy and crime, by the way, does not only apply for the kinds of fatherless homes that future criminals grow up in, it applies for the fathers themselves. My brother-in-law, Bob, has a Gary Larson cartoon on his refrigerator uh, with a, some wild dogs looking at, in the woods, looking in on a former pack mate who's sitting by a doghouse with a chain on with a happy, stupid smile on his face. And the wild dogs are saying, yep, he's got that happy, vacant look. He's been domesticated. And it's true. Marriage domesticates males. Marriage is the preeminent social control we have in this society for young males. And young males in this society are overwhelmingly the perpetrators of violent crime. And you feel this on the street. If you go down to a, a harsh section of Boston and you see two young-looking males walking down the street towards you, you're probably going to put up your radar and say, should I cross the street? What should I do here? I'm, I'm at least going to be a little more alert. If those two, white, if those two males are walking towards you with a five-year-old holding hands in between them, you don't feel any worries at all. Marriage and genuine fatherhood domesticate males and keep them out of trouble 
by, among other things, giving them some kind of future expectations to be tied into and some reason to control themselves and not give in uh, to whatever impulses may be happening. Now, if there is a straight line connection between illegitimacy and crime, there is also a straight line connection between our current welfare system and illegitimacy. Researchers attribute approximately 50% of the increase in illegitimacy in this country since the mid-1960s to the incentive effects of the welfare system, which say, as currently structured, if you are a 15 or 16 year old girl, you want to move out of your house, have your own apartment, we'll pay you to do that. Here's the conditions under which we pay you. Get pregnant, never get married, never have a job, and as long as you fulfill those three conditions, we will continue to pay you an income for the rest of your life. And in fact, if you have more children, as long as you don't have a father and don't have a job, we will continue to raise the amount of money we pay you. Now, Americans are not, and people in general are not stupid, and lots of them respond to economic incentives. And when you subsidize something and pay for it, you tend to get more of it. The danger that we face with illegitimacy is, can't be understated. In 1965, Pat Moynihan, before he was a United States Senator, was a uh, professor, and he wrote an, uh, a very famous book in 1965, which said the black in the 50s, the rate of Ill black illegitimate births was actually below the level of white illegitimate births. By 65, it had gone up to about 22%. And Moynihan said, we have big trouble coming unless this trend is reversed. Because he said from the, from the wild Irish slums of the 1840s in New York City up to the present, societies in which young men grow up without any expectations of the future and without any stable attachment to male authority are asking for disaster and they get it. Moynihan was at that time rejected as a racist who was blaming the victim. What happened since then is the black illegitimacy rate has soared to the point where now about two out of three black births are illegitimate. And the social disaster that has happened has been exactly what Moynihan predicted. As some refinements of the Moynihan theory pointed out, there is a tipping point that occurs in a neighborhood. When you get a neighborhood to a point where approximately 30 to 40 percent of the families in it are having illegitimate children, which means not only the children are growing up with male authority, but the older males are out there on the streets without any wives to domesticate them and rein them in, you get to the point where chaos begins to develop, the neighborhood goes rapidly downhill, and you have the kind of conditions which we have in so much of the American inner cities today. What, make, what makes this even more dangerous is, as other sociologists have pointed out, is the white illegitimacy rate has now risen to, risen to the level of where the black illegitimacy rate was in the mid-1960s and is going up at the same kind of rate. Now, what happened in the black community was terrible for the black community and has had disastrous ripple effects for the rest of the American community. That was 10% of the population. If the 75, if you have 75% of the population that this same problem happens to, then you don't have one, a problem that is spreading throughout the nation. Then you have the nation as a whole literally collapsing and the bonds of society themselves falling apart. Now, welfare is not the only cause of legitimacy, but it is a cause of an important fraction of it. And one of the most important things we can do right now, and we should do before a few more months are out, is drastically change the welfare system so that it works as a true welfare system rather than promoting illegitimacy. It's important to recognize that for most people who are, go through the welfare system, they use it exactly the way the system was intended. They are on it and off it within two years. And for them, the welfare system functions as a kind of safety net, as a kind of extended unemployment insurance that is what everybody believes we should have a welfare system for and, and, and we should keep intact. But there's also a significant fraction of the welfare population that subsists in long-term dependency. And as a result, if you take a snapshot of the welfare system at any given time, half the people on it are there for eight years or more. And that's something that we have to change. Now, there are, there are various welfare reform proposals out there from President Clinton's plan to the Heritage Foundation plans to, to various other things. And 
Now is not the time to get into them, and we can maybe discuss them in questions and answers. But it's essential that we begin to have that kind of debate about how we're going to reform the welfare system and reduce illegitimacy, rather than the sterile debate that we've been stuck in over symbolic conservative issues like the death penalty and symbolic liberal issues like, the death, like gun control. There are other things as well that ought to be part of this new debate. For one thing, the government school system in most of our major cities is totally dysfunctional and gives people no education and no reason to have any expectations of the future in any kind of job other than washing car windows. There can be a debate on that about whether we should have just abolish the government school system and, and, and let people do things privately or whether we should have school vouchers or whether we should put more money into the government school system or, or have any combination of reforms. There's a question about jobs. And the many economists argue that one of the reasons that we have this problem in the inner cities today is that it's no longer possible to come out of school with, say, a ninth grade education, but the ability to, to work hard and show up for work at the same time every day and do your job and get a job in an automobile factory or something like that and make a decent living. Those kinds of, of low-skill, high-paid jobs are gone. And that has made um, many economists, such as William Julius Wilson, argue black males economically irrelevant in the inner cities. And that's one reason for the uh, the, the breakdown of the family there. Other people would say a government job program is just missing the point. We need to focus more on, on deregulating the economy so that there can be more jobs created and then we'll, we don't need to have the government create them. We just need to have the government get out of the way of job creation. Again, that, that's the debate we ought to be having if we're really serious about reducing crime is about jobs and schools and illegitimacy and the drug war rather than how many people the federal government is going to execute or how many guns it's going to ban. Professor James Wright at Tulane University and his colleague Joseph Sheely did a recent study for the National Institute of Justice on juvenile violence. And they concluded, until we rectify the conditions that breed hostility, estrangement, futility, and hopelessness, whatever else we do will come to little or nothing. Widespread joblessness and few opportunities for upward mobility are the heart of the problem stricter gun control laws, more aggressive enforcement of existing laws, a crackdown on drug traffic, police task forces aimed at juvenile gangs, metal detectors at the doors of schools, periodic searches of lockers and shakedowns of students, and other similar measures are inconsequential compared to the true need, the economic, social, and moral resurrection of the inner city. Just how to do this, just how this might be accomplished, and at what cost can be debated, the urgent need to do so cannot. When we Americans stop wasting our time attacking supposedly wicked objects like guns and drugs and begin instead to create a society which fosters individual responsibility and self-control, then, and only then, will we begin to make progress in reducing the terrible problem of American violence. Thank you. I'm, I'm sure I inflamed everyone with at least one comment I made at some point. I'd be, I'd be happy to take any questions you want to talk about. Yeah. I, I, I don't know, and that kind of economics isn't, isn't my strength. Um, I think part of the problem is, is less that the jobs aren't there, then, I mean, there, there seems to be a large enough supply of low-end, you know, dishwashing, janitorial, McDonald's kinds of jobs, but you have people who uh, see them as dead end and don't want to get involved in them. And, and perhaps, um, I, I guess the solution is, is twofold. One is to increase the number of, is to, I would say, to increase the level of small business formation, because that, that tends to be historically where most job growth comes from. And that's, I think, a, you know, maybe a more realistic thing than thinking, than trying to lure Fortune 500 companies to build factories in, in you know, downtown Newark. And then again, it gets, gets back to the education system. I think if you have educated people, for, for example, even if they drop out of school when they're after seventh grade, by the time they're in seventh grade, they're functionally literate, and they can add a, you know, they can add 11 plus 14 
you know, without needing to use a calculator, and they, they can read an article in the newspaper and understand who threw the winning touchdown pass, then you're, you're improving the job skills level of people, and to an extent there will be better, there will be, they'll have a better chance to compete for those jobs. But again, you know, I guess the short answer is I don't really know the answer, but that's the debate, if, if that's the debate, that's the anti-crime debate we ought to be having is more jobs instead of the debate over mandatory sentences and, and whether Phil Graham or, or Bill Clinton is, is more of a, a tough sheriff type kind of feller. Yeah. Well, I, I guess what I found is in America, even though you know, not, not many of us remember the conquest of the West personally, there's still that spirit alive. And in Switzerland, which is a country that fought this you know, guerrilla militia war 500 years ago to establish itself as a nation, that spirit is still there. So to the extent that you have that spirit that's part of the ideals of the nation's founding, it seems to persist. And the difference is in the countries like um, Canada, which were settled peacefully, you never have that spirit formed in the first place. I think we're off to a good start. I'm, I'm a registered Democrat, and I've been, my dad was in the, Democratic, in the state legislature in Colorado as a Democratic leader for 22 years. But I think the November elections are a positive step in that direction because they represent, and not, not even necessarily the new Gingrich level, but of the level of the incoming freshman class. People who have really heard and, and fervently believe themselves, which is why they run the message that government in Washington is just out of hand and it's not something that they're going to reform by you know, a better process or another layer of directors to review, that there are just some things the federal government ought to get out of entirely. And to the extent that we are beginning to move in that direction, and we can continue to move in that direction with citizen pressure, of getting the federal government out of the crime business, you know, except for interstate smuggling and, and genuinely federal issues, to get the federal government out of the welfare business and turn it over to the states, which would certainly design more intelligent programs than the, the backwards one the federal government has, to get the federal government out of the education business. Education, government public school education in this country didn't used to be the kind of thing where you had to have metal detectors in the schools. Um, but to the extent that it's been bureaucratized and taken away from local citizen control, that's part of why things have gone wrong in public education. So the more that we can deconstruct the federal government on every level, the more we make it possible to stop counterproductive, destructive policies, and the more we make it possible to create the breathing room for state and local and voluntary civic organizations to start doing some of the repair work. And, and I think we are in that direction. I, I think that we are what, in retrospect, 1980 through 2010, is going to be seen as a two-step process. In the first step, we had, after a long period of, of balance of power politics in our foreign policy, elected a president who most people you know, thought was kind of a nice guy, but was a little nuts in his foreign policy views, in which he viewed, he said, we're going to take out the Soviet system, we're going to knock it down. And he gave this famous speech in, in 1984, in which he said the, the com communism is a sad, feeble system which even now is in its last days. Everybody thought he was out of his mind. Well, they, they deliberately worked to destabilize communism, to, to, destroy the, to destroy it on a lot of fronts, and in fact, 
communism collapsed. Now that what happened is this huge American government, American government is not in its current cancerously large federal size because of the New Deal and the Great Society and the anti-poverty efforts. We get the size of government we have when we're in wars. Government ballooned in 1917 in World War I, it ballooned again in World War II, and what we've had is since World War II until 1989, we were essentially in a permanent war because we were fighting the Cold War and we had the war state, and as uh, one historian observed, war is the health of the state. And that's what's grown the federal government to its current immense size. The federal government in 1989, having lost its main enemy, um, then began to turn on the American people as many American people see it. It's among other things, most directly, you have the transfer of all this American military equipment being used to fight the war on drugs so that we have people going for a walk in, a, in Mendocino County, in Northern California, and helicopters show up with all these guys pointing atomic weapons, not I mean, pointing automatic weapons at them, force line atomic, pointing automatic weapons at them, because uh, the federal, the US Army is out there to burn down all these marijuana fields. It's, it's the Waco case, it's Randy Weaver, it's a lot of ways in which the American people are beginning to feel besieged by their own federal government. And having gotten rid of the, the enemy in the Cold War in phase one, I think we are now at the beginning of phase two, which is going to be to deconstruct this federal government, which was necessary to fight the Cold War, and which no longer is, and which now that the enemy is gone is more of a threat to the American people than it is their protector. At least that's my prediction in an optimistic mood. I, I don't have I don't have that data, um, but I the to the extent I found domestic homicide data, it is consistent. With, it was consistent with the American pattern, which is husbands who kill wives rarely use guns, you know, they, they prefer to be degrading with strangulation and stabbing and things like that. In contrast, wives who kill husbands, and more broadly ex-spouses, boyfriends, girlfriends, all that kind of states, to the extent that the women are the homicide perpetrators, they usually do use firearms because fire, firearms are equalizers and they balance out the male's larger physical size. And it varies from country to country. Um, but a larger percentage of the female perpetrated homicides are later found by the criminal justice system to be lawful self-protection. That percentage of which they're, they're found lawful self-protection is highest in the United States, either because American males are worse and deserve to get killed more, or perhaps because the American criminal justice system is more tolerant of self-defense in general, or, or maybe a combination of the two. I guess all I can say is the, 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 the academic analysis has suggested that, not, certainly not for all the increase in illegitimacy, but for an important component of it, that the welfare system has been an incentive. And that doesn't mean necessarily that somebody says, mm, you know, I could use an extra 50 bucks, I think I'll get pregnant. But it may mean the decision about whether do they bother to use birth control when they're having sex, and if they, have, if they get pregnant, do they put the baby up for adoption, foster care, abortion, or do they decide to, to have the baby, keep, the ba keep it, and, and get the check? Oh, yeah, go for it. That, that's certainly a factor there, although I'm, I'm not sure, yeah. 
And that's exactly what we need to think about is should we just should we change the means testing, the father presence, all those kinds of things within the welfare system. And that's why we'd be way better off with 50 different, different state welfare systems that might be radically different from each other. And that, that's the whole concept of why we have states. As, as Bob LaFollette said, the uh, great governor of Wisconsin, that the state should be 50 social laboratories. In Colorado uh, last year, the legislature enacted a sort of a half step to welfare reform, which said after, after two years, you can do nothing for two years, but after that point, you can only continue in welfare if you're you know, getting a GED degree or some job training or doing something like that. But that couldn't go into effect. We had to go to the federal government to get their permission to put that into effect, and it, it took nearly a year just to get their permission. The states ought to be able to just have their own, the federal government ought to get out of it and let the states decide what to do with their own money. And I think we'd do a lot better off if we had 50 experimental welfare systems built from the ground up than the current thing, which I don't think has any defenders who really think it works. One of the nice things about human nature is that through every human society throughout history, people have naturally wanted to get married, even males knowing that they'll get domesticated as a result. And I think to the extent to which we've moved away from that has been the extent to which we paid people to do so. And if we stop paying them to do so, then natural human desires, which have been present as, as long as we've known anthropology, you know, I mean, there's, there's no society that we've ever seen where people didn't get married. Um, and I, I think it can reassert itself pretty rapidly once the government gets out of the business of paying people to do the opposite. Did you have a follow-up on that? And I think you're, you're also, it's also true that it's not, it's not just a, a low income type problem. In, in, in Colorado, I have uh, family friends who are, who are students in the, in the Cherry Creek High Schools, which is the, the elite suburban high school system of, of metropolitan Denver. And you have the same kind of thing of, of, kid, of girls getting baby fever when they're 15 or 16 years old, and, and a, a good number of them, lesser than in some other situations, but a good number of them getting pregnant. So it, it starts, it start, it does, there's both the government economic incentives of paying people to do it, then there's the economic incentive of what, what future do you have if you don't do it, and then there's also the degree to which society, through, not through governmental coercion and making it illegal to have an illegitimate child, but the degree to which people say as a moral principle, it is wrong to have a child out of wedlock. Now, in, in Great Britain, where the illegitimacy rate uh, is also going berserk, 42% of the people, only 42% of the people, say that it's not wrong to have a child out of wedlock. And you don't, the percentages aren't that high in the United States, 
but you still have very large fractions of the population agreeing with Surgeon Gen former Surgeon General Joyce Lynn Elders, who said that if you choose that having a child without getting married is simply a matter of personal choice, and nobody should say that's wrong. The government clearly shouldn't make it illegal, because that's people's personal choices, right? But I think as a society, it's imperative that we strongly say that it is wrong. And when you, and unless you're Murphy Brown, who's sociologically similar to about 1% of the illegitimate mothers in this country, that in the vast majority of circumstances, when you choose to have a child knowing that the child will only have one parent, you are doing tremendous harm to that child's prospects. David, yes. I think what I'm hearing is that there's something much deeper than all of this. Uh, and a profound sense of alienation, a profound sense of isolation, separateness, of unconnectedness, uh, and that, that, that what, what's happening is that people are reaching out in kind of desperation to achieve some sense of meaning, uh, some sense of connecting to something. Uh, and that that's much deeper than 50 bucks a week more or anything like that. that uh, and it's much it, it goes much beyond a uh, registered Democrat having a contract with America. It, 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 it's, it's something profound in our culture. I think. It's that the band aid question. Uh, and that it, 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 it's a big wound. Yeah. And one of the. Well. I think you're right about that, that there is this pervasive sense of alienation and isolation. But one, pe one explanation would be, well, that's just the effect of you know, modernity. You know, we're, we're getting larger and more urban and more anonymous and industrial and all that kind of stuff. But that, I don't think that's a sufficient explanation because, for example, in Great Britain from 1850 to, to 1900, you, you had the, probably the fastest case of a society in history, um, industrializing, modernizing, urbanizing. And for them, their illegitimate birth rate was already pretty low. It fell even further, and their crime rate kept on going down. One of the things that I think is going wrong here is, back to de Tocqueville, he talked about the civil institutions as what are really the glue of American society. And again, he thought this was a very unique kind of thing. You know, in contrast to, say, France, where you have these authoritarian structures like the old monarchy or the new government in France and the, the Catholic Church, which kind of sat on, the, sat on top of society and people had all these, these vertical ties you know, the successors, layers of brown nosing, essentially, up, upwards. The United States was a much more horizontally integrated society, and the way things were horizontally integrated was through these voluntary associations. You know, the, the church groups, the, the Moose Lodge, uh, you know, the, the young men's uh, militia drilling squad, all these kinds of things which de Tocqueville said Americans, way more than people of any other society, come together in these voluntary associations. And these are, these are what really hold American society together. Now, one of the things that's gone wrong has been the degree to which, with good intentions, the federal government and government in general has displaced these voluntary associations. When you have welfare being primarily dispensed by the union, by the, the Benevolent Protector, uh, Protective Order of Elks by the Presbyterian Church with money that people have voluntarily handed over in their pockets. There is, um, in the recipient, a very strong sense of reciprocal obligation. And the, the, the donors certainly expect it. So we're giving you this money, but we expect you to turn your life around and, and not be permanently in our pockets. In contrast, when that same thing is done by the federal government, it's just a check, there's no expectation of things that have to improve, and even to the extent you enact federal work requirements or any of this other stuff, that's just a law coming down from some anonymous thing rather than a community bond that says, because I took this money from you, I now feel obligated to maybe stop getting drunk at 9 o'clock in the morning and you know, wait to start drinking till, till dinner time. And it happens on all sorts of levels. If you look at the, the public school system in this country in 1900, one out of 80 adult Americans was a school board member. And I know what Mark Twain said, you know, first God created it. First God created idiots, that was for practice, then he created school boards. Nevertheless, you had the schools being these kind of almost voluntary civic associations with close community ties, with the, the people closely involved. Since then, and especially since World War II, there's been this tremendous consolidation of school districts. Now in Colorado, we have things like Jefferson County with a population of 600,000 is one school district. 
Well, obviously, you can't have any, you know, this, the school district then has no more connection with the community in any real sense, you know, than, than the United States Army does. The more that we can move away from this monolithic, hierarchical, centralized control at both the federal and state levels, and the more we can get the government, the coercive institution, out of the way, the more I think the natural bonds of affection between people, marriage on one level and, and voluntary civic associations on another, will resurrect themselves and begin to restore some of that sense of community. As long as they're unarmed, that's fine. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me.